this is uh, the Meet the Fed panel. Uh, it's the Meet the Fed, Meet the X Fed, Meet the TV Feds. So, uh, you know, on the panel we've got David McCallum from TV show NCIS. Okay. And Leon Carroll, the uh, technical advisor to the TV show NCIS, a retired NCIS. And what we're going to do is before everybody else gets introduced, we're going to play Spot the Lamer like we do all the, every year. So, uh, Priest, if you would, uh, we've got the first three contestants. Give me about three or four more. Absolutely. Should I, should I talk about these contestants? Sure, absolutely. So, I can enunciate to the back row. So, we, we have, would you like to introduce you or shall I introduce you? Okay. I've known her since she was this tall. She's actually the daughter of one of the panelists. These are her two boyfriends. <laughs> who she met at con. This one asked me to repeatedly hit him in the nuts. I don't know why. We have it on film. <laughs> Okay, as Priest picks you out, come on up, and what we're going to do is, uh, you know, every, DEF CON, they've been playing Spot the Fed for years, so we've been playing Spot the Lamer. Uh, so uh, you guys are going to vote, and then we all have gifts for uh, the winner. So we've got to take this stuff seriously. This crew is definitely uglier than the first crew you brought up here, Priest. We just have Except. to juggle this. Because this thing spins like that. Uh, there's no way of fixing it. One more? We good? Okay, okay got it. All right, that's good. All right. So uh, we're going to go down the line and ask questions. and. Uh, uh, so the first question that we're going to, I get the first one. <laughs> uh, what the, okay, we'll, we'll go, we'll stay, in, stay with the standard. Where do you store your porn? Dropbox. <laughs> Dropbox. Okay. okay, David. Where do your boyfriends store their porn? Dropbox. Um, <laughs> do you keep it for them? Does your father know? He does now. <laughs> Why are you turning red, Mark? Because I put it all on Dropbox. Is that what you used to do? Father-daughter bonding, you know. <laughs> Father-daughter bondage, what? <laughs> My question is for the gentleman in the uh, Irish green on the end there. Have you ever bragged about the speed of your processor and the size of your RAM? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Would Can you, you care to elaborate on that? Yeah. <laughs> Just to Look know. For another boyfriend. <laughs> Was it an Adam? <laughs> well, it is proof that if you do this too much, you go blind. For number three, right here. So, have you ever bought virtual things with real money? Uh, only with bitcoins. <laughs> <laughs> He can tell you about his 23rd level paladin if you'd like. My question is for the young lady standing right in front of me. Do you spend more hours using your computer, your iPad, or your gaming console? Uh, if the computer is the gaming console, does that count? If, it, <laughs> if the computer is the gaming console, does that count? Doesn't count. Doesn't count. Uh, computer. All right. That was pretty boring. Let <laughs> There's no such thing as a girl gamer. It's a myth. <laughs> Marcus. I'll, uh, I'll leave her boyfriends alone. You, sir. On the uh, Big Bang Theory. Don't be thinking on the Big Bang Theory. One thing shows up in the opening scene of every episode. What is that one thing? The atom. Nope. How about Penny's boobs? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, wait a minute, what? <laughs> Do you have like special access or something? Okay, I'm gonna have to just slow down every time now. We're gonna have a frame by frame. <laughs> okay, right down here. In the movie War Games, 
when Broderick hacked the uh, school's computer, what was the password? I Pencil? Pencil. Pencil. Good. I think you had help. She's a little young for that, by the way. I was this tall. Then <laughs> how wide were you? When you were born. About as wide as you are. And a lot wider. Jerry. Don't tease, dear. She asked me if I wanted to play a game. I'll, I'll take the guy with the hat down here. The guy with the hat on crooked. Battlefield 3 or Call of Duty? That would be you, sir. Don't look stupid. <laughs> you know what? Do I have to pick? I like both. Remember, her father's up there, so look smart. Um, the one, uh, Call of Duty. Zombies. You say that like a question, sir. <laughs> You're not winning points. Lips or purses? You know, he worked for the president. I have, uh, what? <laughs> the response was, I, uh, what? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Say mass effect, sir. Mass effect, sir. Say, say herpes. Herpes. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go with the uh, Jolly Green here. No, I'm Jolly Green. Oh, sorry. Do you void warranties? <laughs> yes. Regularly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle. And other things. I'll go with contestant number two. God, space you're getting off easy. <laughs> Which of the following are your favorite foods? Your mother's meatloaf. Taco Bell. Brownies made by priest. <laughs> <laughs> How about your brownies? <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't actually make brownies, but I do an awesome lobster. I've got this sauce that we're... <laughs> pra praised you. Praised oh, no, you, it's really good. Praised you pick one. I pick one? Yeah, pick one. This is an ecumenical question. It'll apply to everyone. Hmm. <laughs> How about the dude in the wife beater shirt? The wife beater? The wife oh, there are two dudes in the wife beater shirt? The one, who's, who, the one who's trying to hide from me, bobbing his head. This one right here? Yeah, that one. Beater. He's dancing, I guess. See, it's just super tight. That's he can see what's underneath. <laughs> what he's going to say, he sees what's underneath. <laughs> He's still the, place, over. The, the place for glistening, listening, yeah. Um, what is your definition or your explanation of doing a do? Doing if a someone do. invites you to do a do, what does that mean? Not do a dude, sir, you're safe. Do a do. <laughs> do the do. Do the do? Uh, slamming back Mountain Dew followed by tons and tons of alcohol. You are such a lightweight. <laughs> it's somebody, all about the jolt cola, man. What's the matter with you? Somebody gave him that answer, I'm sure. No, sir, I did not. <laughs> for the contestant on the uh, end in green. God, they love you for some reason. Because I'm old you, like them. I'm old like them, that's why. <laughs> in that case, do you believe that Area 51 exists? And if so, where are Areas 1 to 50? As your attorney, do not answer. Don't answer that question. There's a helicopter on the roof. Well, they're all out there in the Nellis facility, so yes, they do all exist. <laughs> Pass the microphone down, please. Do you have some guys in red shirts to come get him? We'll take care of it. We promise no extreme additions unless absolutely necessary, and you deserve it. So the gentleman in the black T-shirt here towards the end, right there. So, have you viewed more videos on YouTube or RedTube? <laughs> yes. Neither. Uh, Create my own. Uh, 
Okay, now we're going to vote. You guys are going to vote who the lamer is. Contestant number one. Wow. Let me try that again. Contest. Oh my God. Contestant number one. Okay, you Y'all can have a seat. Suck ups. Oh boy, <laughs> you failed miserably. Contestant number two. All right, you, you. Contestant number three. Contestant number two, you can sit down. Contestant number four. That's kind of a tie. Bad wheel two. Contestant number five, raise your hand, please. Okay, you're down. Thank Six. You. All right, you guys are out here. You guys are gone. Thank you for playing. Guys. Last one down. Raise your hand. Thank you for doing that. All right. Oh, one last time. Raise your hand. Last guy down. All right, you can sit down. We have a winner. Come on up here. We we have the we have the coveted Meet the Fed T-shirt. We have a uh, DOD Cybercrime Response Team T-shirt. Look at the camera. We've got your SNL. And if you would go down, we have uh, presents for you. Here's a bag. So we've got an NSA mouse pad and a really cool NSA translucent cup. You can't even see the microphone in it. I stole a bunch of swag from Verizon, so here you go. A card for the coveted ninja badge. Have a mint. (laughs) (laughs) Have a bottle opener. This is a very specially designed and coveted old-fashioned glass. I assume you're old enough to drink whiskey, not just light beer anymore. Uh, This is etched. It's a collector's item. It's an heirloom. I'm sure it's one that you want to pass on to your children. And because it's from NSA, you'll never lose it. famous meet the fed flag <laughs> and a book of brain ticklers oh. all right we also we have a special surprise we have we have a free vacation and the, the other dude uh, I love that a trip for two All right, what we're going to do now is we're going to let the uh, panelists introduce themselves, tell you what they do for a living or not, and uh, and then we're going to open it up for questions, so line up for the questions. David. It's always difficult when half the audience has already heard everything you've said once, but um, I've been with NCIS uh, NCIS now for nine years, the television program, not the real guys, but I've also had a lot of time with the real people down in Washington, with director Klukey and his wife Mona, and seen everything that the real NCIS does. And as part of that, I've met with Jim here, who I thank profusely for inviting me here today. But at the same time, I also had the pleasure of going down to Atlanta and going to the cybercrime conference. And I I carry my little notebook because uh, we have a bunch of writers back in Valencia. And they're very, very, very good. And I try so hard to keep everything that I do, particularly in autopsy, to be as real and as accurate as possible. So I spend a great deal of time now um, 
making notes, taking them back, sitting down, being with the writers. This year I was on the carrier Wasp. I was given an entire tour by Admiral Skolansky. Uh, I've been aboard the Reagan and met the, the, the skipper back then. I've just done so much with the Navy and the Marine Corps. My wife here is on the board of the Marine Corps Scholarship Foundation, and they've raised, raised $70 million to send the kids of Marines to college, which is quite amazing. So it, it, it's quite extraordinary that someone, a wee kid from Glasgow, as I'm known as back home, managed to sort of climb up here and I'm on panels and at the 50th anniversary of the Marine Corps Scholarship Ball, I was the MC. I never dreamt in my life that I would do things like that, but it is such a pleasure to have that involvement. And as I said earlier, to be able to give something back because I get so much from my life right now. Thank you. I'm Rob Joyce, I'm the uh, Deputy Director of the National Security Agency's Information Assurance Directorate. I've been with NSA for 23 years, and my organization is responsible for the protection of national security systems, which are anything that carries classified information, handles military command and control, or, uh, or supports intelligence. So we do everything from developing equipment to finding vulnerabilities and consulting with departments, agencies, and those in need. Thanks. I'm Leon Carroll. I'm the technical advisor on the TV show that uh, I get to work with Mr. Uh, David McCallum all the time. And I am a former Marine officer and 23-year veteran with NCIS. And I sit with the writers, the guys that, and gals that he just spoke about, and I get to wave the bullshit flag. I, uh, I try to keep uh, our stories and what we do, whatever the investigative genre. <laughs> he, he's, he's from Scotland. Scotch. But uh, actually, we do this on the show quite a bit, so uh, no problem. <laughs> Uh, actually, every, every year we have a great tequila bar just before Christmas, and uh, there are a lot of people after we say rap that stick around and uh, eat tacos and drink tequila shots. Anyway, it's my pleasure to be here. I thank Jim for inviting both David and I representing the show. I work with a great cast, and we have a bunch of great people in our crew, and thank goodness we're the number one drama on TV. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know who these guys are, but I love them. Yeah. <laughs> so you guys are going to save some of that for the questions too, right? Uh, now, I mean, if we get good questions, you guys are going to help out the, uh, the audience. So good afternoon, hackers. I'm Mark Sox. I'm a retired Army officer. Did uh, 20 years as a Corps of Engineers guy, jumped out of airplanes, uh, blew things up. We built targets for the artillery. That's what engineers do. But along the way, I had a passion for computers and networks and things that talk to each other. And Uncle Sam figured out I knew probably more about computers than, um, than I knew about <laughs> blowing things up. So I wound up uh, running 18th Airborne Corps networks back in the mid-90s, uh, 4th Infantry Division's networks in the late 90s, and was summoned to Washington at the, in 1998 after a series of intrusions that scared the living crap out of the Pentagon and we stood up the Joint Task Force for Computer Network Defense. We were the first group to really take on this problem of what happens in cyberspace when people are attacking DOD and others. That group is today, uh, the DNA of it lives on in uh, U.S. Cyber Command, and a lot of good things have happened since then. When I retired from the uh, military at the end of 2001, September 11 had just happened, and I was summoned by the White House to be an appointee working for George Bush, uh, actually underneath Condi Rice's staff in the National Security Council, where I, I spent a year and a half uh, at a policy level, but I was a geek in the White House. And I, get, I tell you what, that is one cool experience, because everybody else there is political appointees. There are one or two people that have the technical skills, and it is fascinating to work at that level. I would uh, really encourage anybody who has these opportunities, if you can serve your country at that level, please do so. It's an experience that... Um, just that like these guys do. are serving their country. Uh, yeah, just like these guys, yeah. 
So today I am at Verizon, so this is why I get free Verizon swag. And if I get a good question, if somebody comes up and tells me how much they've hacked AT&T this afternoon, I will happily give them <laughs> some more Verizon swag. There's your first good question. Uh, good, af or good afternoon, I'm Mark Weatherford. Um, like Mark Sox, I am a retired naval officer. I was a, uh, spent 20 years as a cryptologist in the Navy. Um, since I left the Navy, I've done a number of things. I'm currently the Deputy Undersecretary for Cybersecurity at the De um, Department of Homeland Security. I was appointed uh, by Secretary Napolitano about seven months ago. Um, prior to DHS, I was the Chief Information or Chief in Chief in Chief Security Officer uh, and Vice President at the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, where I worked with the uh, electric utilities across North America, uh, helping them put in the policies and programs to uh, to secure their environments. Uh, prior to that, I was the uh, worked for Governor Schwarzenegger. I was the Chief Security Officer for the State of California. Uh, for a couple of years, and then prior to that, I was in uh, Colorado as a chief security officer there for a couple of years. Um, at DHS, we uh, uh, we have quite a uh, quite a growing responsibility for cybersecurity. Uh, we have three major functions. We um, protect the .gov environment, so all of the uh, federal civilian agencies, we're responsible for working with all of them to make sure that they have not only the, the policies in place, but the controls in place and that they're doing all the right things um, to secure their different environments. Um, we also work with um, the private sector, primarily with the critical infrastructures, um, helping them and uh, helping them respond to uh, incidents and, uh, and intrusions into their environments. Uh, a lot of control system work there. Uh, we also respond to um, incidents of national significance, so anything really big happens. Um, we put teams on the ground working with private sector and government organizations to help mitigate and respond to those. So, um, and like Mark said, DHS is a, is a great place to be. Uh, I don't know if you heard, any of you heard my uh, speech yesterday, but we are always actively recruiting, uh, and we're recruiting for people who um, can think outside the typical um, government, uh, federal government way of thinking. So that's why I love uh, the con, because um, I get to meet a lot of people. And I've actually picked up a few very interesting resumes for people that want to come and, uh, and participate in what we're doing in the government. Good afternoon. So first off, you know, I'd like to recognize uh, any uh, fellow combat veterans or veterans, if you'd just stand up real quick, if we have any veterans out there. All right. Thank, thank you for serving. Bravo. You know, yeah, thanks again for serving. Name's Jerry Dixon. I was uh, the former director of the National Cybersecurity Division at uh, DHS, uh, ran U.S. CERT. Worked at uh, somebody's, everybody's favorite agency, the IRS. I ran the incident response team there. But uh, prior to that, I uh, ran uh, security for Marriott International. And so, you know, now I'm with a group called Team Cymru, a not-for-profit uh, security research group. If you get a chance, yeah, <laughs> go, go out to the, uh, you know, Cymru website. There's uh, tools that we give back to the community. Spell it. Uh, C-Y-M-R-U. Yeah. So uh, if you're not familiar with it. But uh, we have tools like the malware hash tool. We provide a lot of things. We try to give back to the... Uh, internet community at large. We also have a group called Dragon Research that we're always looking for uh, researchers to help out, uh, basically being able to take a look at our insight and, and basically find other ways to develop tools to uh, help a lot of different organizations. Thank you. And good afternoon. My name is Riley Repco. And first off, I want to thank Jim and all of you participants and thank DEF CON. I mean, it's, it's and all inspiring to me every time I come out here to see more and more of these young wizards that are here. Um, I recently left a, uh, an executive position at the Department of the Air Force and OSD. Uh, what an opportunity of being able to serve with some of the finest 18th century minds around. <laughs> all right, I uh, came from the private sector. My role there was to kind of build the bridge between our needs and your solutions. You know, kind of identify the seekers and the solvers. And as uh, Mike Hayden, you know, former director of the Central Intelligence Agency and NSA used to say, he said, God made the four 
natural domains, air, land, space, and sea. Man made the cyber domain. God has done a better job. But um, I'm delighted to be here and look forward to answering any questions you may have. Hi, I'm Michelle Kwan, and I just want to start off by thanking those folks at DEF CON for bringing this panel back. Um, this is my 10th con. Um, happy to be here. I was, let's start back, back in those days. I was in 2004, winner of the most innovative antenna, the Wi-Fi shootout. Um, I then moved on to be the director of wireless at the Department of Justice. I then moved to be the, the deputy CISO at the Department of Justice where I built the Justice Security Operations Center. And from there, I moved to be the director of US CERT. Now I have my own consulting firm and we specialize in security operations centers. I'm Rich Marshall. I feel like a, a badger at an AKC registered uh, dog show with everybody that's so, so bright on the panel. Uh, I'm a lawyer by training and I'm very proud of the fact that I do information warfare law. Uh, I've had a checkered past. I got involved in electronics in a, the Southeast Asian war games in an F-105 where we were chum waiting for the missiles to come up at us so we could take them out and protect the rest of the aircraft that came in. We were uh, first in, last out. And I learned early on how important electronic warfare could be because you've got your life on the line. Uh, I later became uh, a lawyer in the Air Force and uh, had a successful career there. And then I moved on to the National Security Agency where I was the Associate General Counsel for Information uh, Assurance. Uh, worked for four different uh, gentlemen who happened to lead, that lead in that particular position. My proudest accomplishment when I was in that position uh, was being the legal architect for eligible receiver 97 because that demonstrated to the national leadership that information warfare was real. It also gave me an opportunity to learn a couple of very important leadership lessons. When I briefed the general counsel of NSA and uh, my boss, my line boss, on what we could do, uh, they said, well, you need to brief the DOD general counsel. You have to go up the food chain. I said, fine, let's uh, I'll arrange joint schedules. And they said, no, you go by yourself. I briefed the DOD general counsel. And I think you were in on that, that briefing at that time. Uh, and once again, it was great job. Uh, you need to brief the attorney general now. I said, yes, ma'am. Uh, I'll arrange our schedules. And she said, no, you go by yourself. The life lesson there is whenever you're doing anything uh, without a safety net, you always go by yourself because then they have plausible deniability. <laughs> but ER 97 was so successful, uh, and like any successful venture, it has a thousand fathers. A failure is born illegitimate. Uh, but that was an absolutely uh, awesome experience. I subsequently moved on, uh, worked at the White House with Mark, uh, and then later came back to NSA and did legislative liaison, which was just absolutely a fascinating uh, opportunity. And then I subsequently had an opportunity to go down to the Department of Homeland Security, where I was the Director of Global Cybersecurity Management, another fascinating opportunity. And I retired from NSA on the 15th of December, which was a Friday, and then the following Monday I moved to a startup that lasted three and a half months. Uh, I'm suing them. <laughs> Part of my DNA. Uh, and now, like Michelle, I uh, run a consulting company and uh, really enjoy what I'm doing. And I'm just very happy to be here. This is my 11th one. Thanks, Rich. For those of you who don't know about Elder Receiver 97, I highly recommend you know, it and then the follow-on Solar Sunrise Real World event set the course for a large part of where at least DOD is today in, in cyber security. 
Uh, my name is Lynn Wells. Uh, I'm a career Navy. Uh, I then spent uh, 16 years in the Office of Secretary of Defense, including a couple of years as DOD uh, Chief Information Officer. Uh, some years ago, I was a speaker uh, here at DEF CON. I've now been promoted. I'm a goon. And so uh, things are looking up. <laughs> Uh, right now, I'm over at National Defense University at a small center called the Te Center for Technology and National Security Policy. And from this, I'd like to ask the audience two questions. Uh, we did a conference about a year ago on the trajectory of revolutions, looking at the Arab Spring and how are things going to work out. And one of the most articulate spokespeople in the conference was a White House producer for Al Jazeera English, and she was 26 and talked about how Al Jazeera used Facebook and uh, Twitter and blogosphere and other social media to alert the correspondents to the emerging issues. Uh, and so um, at the end of the conference, I said, um, what's the next big thing? And her answer at 26 was, I'm too old, ask the young people. So but there are a lot of you young people out here, and part of the problem is we have is that usually in our conferences, I ask how many people are under 35 and get single-digit hands. So the, one of the great values for us, for me at least, of coming here is to get your opinions, and I'd really value your thoughts on what the, you know, how five years from now you would vector people to better sources of information. The last point is that <clears throat> um, we're working with DARPA on a project called Social Media and Strategic Communication. And one of the things that my center's been asked to do is look at the risk posed by social media. And not just to leak the wrong stuff, but that are we raising a generation that thinks in 140 character sound bites? And uh, how do you put checks and balances into a governance system where the velocity of information is so enormous? Again, if any of you are interested in working on that, I would love to talk to you. So I'd just like to close by saying last month I had the privilege of beginning my 49th consecutive year with DOD. And every morning I wake up and say, wow, what really interesting thing is going to happen today. And if any of you are interested in careers of government, I cannot commend it to you hardly enough. Thanks. Wow, almost time for a golden anniversary then. Huh? <laughs> yeah, <excuse me. laughs> Um, so I'm Rod Beckstrom. I've spent most of my life uh, in Silicon Valley uh, doing high-tech companies, but had the great honor to work for the federal government for a while. So I wanted to share that story and to encourage those of you who haven't had the privilege to work for the government yet to consider doing that. Um, I fell in love with computers when I learned to program in Fortran when I was a teenager um, and started my first uh, software company when I was in graduate school uh, at age 24 in my garage apartment in Palo Alto. I got very lucky because we built something that people seem to actually need in trading derivatives around the world, and that company grew to be a global company and went public on NASDAQ, and I got to run that and build a company from scratch to a public uh, entity and run that for five years, which was a great experience, and then got to work with a lot of other uh, good startups in, in Silicon Valley and helped start a, a number of companies. Um, I was in New York on 9-11, my life changed, like most many of our lives changed, and uh, was called to a form of service and worked on track two diplomacy uh, in war zones around the world. That network spread in a viral fashion, and we decided to model it on Al-Qaeda. And by modeling on Al-Qaeda, we had to then understand it and decode it, and that led to a book called The Starfish and the Spider, the unstoppable power of leaderless organizations, which describes decentralized movements and networks, including Al-Qaeda and many other networks like th this community. Um, because of that book, I got incredibly fortunate, and Admiral McConnell, the director of national intelligence, who is an amazing man, was very kind and recruited me to be on his senior advisory group because he thought the ideas in the book were quite provocative about networks, cybersecurity, and social networks. And so it was my great honor to serve on that group with him and other leaders from the intelligence community, uh, as well as four other members from the private sector. And then I was asked to run the National Cybersecurity Center, which was created by a presidential directive, uh, and Admiral McConnell and Secretary Chertoff uh, and SecDef and the Attorney General asked me to come and stand up that uh, organization, uh, which is a startup. So I'm a startup guy, but this is a startup in government, which was completely different. And I was lucky to work with uh, many of the great people at this table. We got the concept of operations approved. We created the 21st component of DHS, 
The first component was the Coast Guard, created in 1790. That then got merged subsequently, I think, into the organization that Mark's running now. And Michelle and I work together as well on these issues. Anyway, it was a great experience. I worked for the Bush administration, also for the Obama administration, left and had the good fortune to be asked to lead ICANN, the multi-stakeholder body. This time in the federal government gave me the tools that I needed to work at ICANN and to understand not just the private sector, but the public sector and how incredibly challenging and important the work are that everybody in the government does and just gave me a tremendous appreciation for the people who do public service. Amazing experience, changed my life. Uh, someday I'll probably go back uh, and certainly I have the passion for uh, the importance of governance institution, be they governmental or multi-stakeholder. So I encourage each of you to, to really consider it uh, in, in your lives, uh, and it's uh, uh, great for the country that we have people like Len serving for 49 years and others. So thank you. I'm just honored to be here among the giants at this table. Thank you. I'm Jim Christie. I'm with the uh, Department of Defense Cyber Crime Center. Uh, just want to talk a little bit about what we do. We have uh, one of our uh, business areas is we have the world's largest accredited digital forensics lab. So we have about 110 digital forensic examiners uh, working all kinds of cases from terrorism, espionage, child pornography, uh, fraud, you know, you name it, the homicides, you name it. Uh, we also have a uh, training academy where we train all the criminal and counterintelligence investigators in the Department of Defense on how to conduct a cybercrime investigation and how to do digital forensics. Uh, there are several other business areas. One of, one of the uh, initiatives that we have is the Center for Digital Forensics Academic Excellence. Uh, the problem we have is we can't find qualified people that can pass our tests so that they can work on digital forensics on real live criminal cases. So what we've done is created a partnership with academia to create standards for digital forensic examiners. And uh, uh, that we're in a pilot phase right now with about nine, two, four year and graduate level universities. And we're opening it up to other universities, everybody else uh, come September. Another initiative we have is the DC3 Digital Forensics Challenge. So anybody out there taking the challenge? All right. What, right now we have about 945 teams from 51 countries participating. And uh, I would encourage you to get either yourself or your staff or your kids involved in, uh, uh, in participating in digital forensics because we need good people in the government uh, and uh, we're always hiring. Uh, one of the other things that we have is the uh, uh, digital crime scene challenge and what we did was we brought for DEF CON kids, we have three uh, suites set up upstairs and uh, all the DEF CON kids are scheduled to go through and process a digital crime scene in three in 15 minutes and, and come up with the evidence. So kind of fu kind of fun. So if you get a chance, if you have kids here, uh, uh, bring them through. Another initiative is an online self-assessment on cybercrime investigations and uh, uh, digital forensics. So if you uh, go to our website, dc3.mil, and all the links are, are, are there. Uh, take the self-assessment, tell us what you think. If you guys, I would really love to get questions for you guys to add to our self-assessment. So to make it a little more difficult. So uh, at that point, uh, I want to thank our, our, our panel, and now we're going to open it up to questions from the floor. Uh, my question is for uh, Rob and Rich from NSA or really any of the uh, three letters. Um, do you see a shift in your recruitment to move away from more the standard of uh, having a four-year degree and more and have the exception based upon experience? So NSA is certainly a very talent-based organization. So um, to come in and be a technical person in NSA, you, don't, you, you absolutely do not have to have a technical degree. Um, so recognition of past accomplishments, your current work portfolio and things absolutely can get you in the door. I think you know, one of the big things we look for is the, that audacity, right? That's one of the reasons we're here at DEF CON. You look at, um, 
Hackers often know the networks they're penetrating better than the system administrators know them themselves. So we're looking for people with that kind of mentality that really want to dig into the details, understand the technology, and apply it. So, so that's what we're looking for. Great, thank you. Let me let me add a, an Mark, observation. Did you want to, oh. Yeah. Oh. oh, go ahead, Mark. Let me go first, Rich. I will. Do you mind? No, hell, no. You used to be my boss. I got to say yes. Yeah. <laughs> you take uh, his turn. He's going to sue your ass. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, go ahead, Rich. Uh, no, I, I, that, that is absolutely right, you know, and, and I talked about this a little bit yesterday in my uh, remarks. And I know that there's a perception, and, and we talk a lot about um, the different programs that we have uh, that we're supporting at, at the universities and colleges around the country, but, you know, some of the smartest people I know do not have a college degree. Some of the smartest people that are working for us right now, and some of the smartest people that I had working for me in the private sector. And I think we as a government, and, and, and I can, it's a little bit of a challenge sometimes for us, but we have to encourage better that, that you can have that equivalent experience without a four-year degree. And, and the, the way I like to, and the way one of my, my really smart friends put it to me is, I spent four years with my hands on a keyboard well, a lot of other people were, were spending four years in college. And I would like to point out, Dr. Dan Manson's right up here in front. He, he's a professor at uh, a Cal Poly in, uh, in Pomona. And he has an incredible program there. They just ran a cyber camp last week. And they had a 60-year-old dude in there in that cyber camp uh, and competing in a CTF on last Friday. So, you know, there is no, there's no age limit and there's no, um, there's no educational qualifications like real experience in my mind. The Olympics are taking place in London. I don't think this is a news flash for anyone. But everyone who was participating as an athlete in that event started out extremely young in their particular sport being trained. Most of them don't have college degrees. I do not like the word hacker. You're vulnerability researchers. And that's the way you should present yourself, number one. Number two, we need more emphasis on STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math. And I realize that <laughs> plays well. But I've long been an advocate of recruiting at DEF CON. And I got some pushback from some entities that said, we're not going to recruit criminals. And I said, they're not criminals until they're prosecuted. <laughs> So give them an opportunity to get out of their mother's basement and, and earn a living. <laughs> one, 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 don't, don't sit down yet. One, one other comment. Vulnerability researchers, in my mind, are today's artists. When you look at the great painters in the past, none of them had a college degree. They learned it themselves through experimentation. And that's what vulnerability researchers are known to do. So view yourself as an artist. You've got to have technical skills. Those painters develop their technical skills as well. But they had a fascinating imagination. And in their mind's eye, they were able to create art. So as you're doing your vulnerability research, make some great art. Really loud, please. So we talk about education, and there's more to you know, being a vulnerability researcher to just what you know, right? We have a mindset. I mean, the brightest people, we don't have degrees. We don't have certifications. We don't need them. Um, but we're forbidden also from teaching the next generation. I mean, a lot of, you know, um, two-year universities, four-year universities, a lot of us could really teach people. Now, it's not impossible. I've found other ways around it. But it would be something that not only to get jobs for the future of the people, but we need a way to teach. I mean, I look back, I look back here, I see a lot of potential teachers, and uh, not just the jobs, but the future. Now, specifically to the NCIS staff, I would ask, would it be, I don't watch TV, because I want to do stuff for the kids, right? Teach my kids the best I can. <laughs> exactly. Would it be possible to have an episode where you had maybe even a season where you know there's a big security crime. This you guys say this guy was the guy that um, found it, you know, and you go back his life 
about how he got there, not just the end point and make a big deal that he was the person that was able to actually find the crime, but how he actually, but how he actually you know, became his life. So you kind of, you know, how we grow into being vulnerability researchers. So I ask if you guys could pass that on as a potential plot. The writers are very much open to suggestions, and I try to take things back to them. Um, what you're really saying is the background to a, something that's already happened, which is always the hardest thing for them to do, because either you do it in a flashback or else some people talk about it, neither of which is instant, <coughs> neither of which is really very exciting on television. But it is something you... When you say the background, you mean... I mean, I'm much more fascinated about what you're saying when you say that you can't teach because you don't have university degrees, therefore you don't have your, what we call in England, the poem of education and everything. Well, it goes to a point that people have problems. There are people that are hackers they don't, or vulnerability researchers. They don't even know that they're doing it, right? You know kids that know stuff and can do stuff on computers that nobody can do. But they don't have any role models they can base off of, right? It's very, very hard. There's no way to measure yourself versus what you know versus what you don't know. We need sports athletes and stuff. We broadcast that shit all over the place, right? They know right. if they want to be an athlete. We don't have a way for them to say, you know what? You're doing the right kind of stuff. You just don't know it. it it's something that we need some kind of role model in, in maybe a program or something that shows not only the end point that they, they fixed a crime or something, but so they can identify with who they are. Well, it's definitely an episode that involves McGee, who is our computer vulnerability investigator. So I think that it's an idea that I can definitely and will put to the writers. Thank you. We only have four minutes left, so I'll be quick. short questions. My question's half for the incident response teams and about half for the NCIS crew. Um, about, like, how, how does, are you seeing the CSI effect in regards to your specific discipline? Because I know that's still a big problem. And for the incident response people, is that something that's being mitigated with education? And then for the, for NCIS, is that something that you guys, you know, you do try and handle realistically on the show? Do you deal with it? Do you have to, like, shoot down ideas by just saying, okay, that's just the CSI effect? Um, what, what are you seeing? Really quick, uh, I was uh, on jury duty when the show first started, and the attorneys and the judge made a point of instructing the jury that what they would hear in that courtroom would not replicate anything that's done on a, on a one-hour TV show, 43 minutes. And believe it or not, NCIS was the show that they used. <laughs> so I'll turn it over to the policy guys here, but that is something that obviously we look at as well, but we're, we're here to entertain. And so in 43 minutes of film or whatever, you know, we're going to show, you know, a lot of things that are abbreviated. For instance, Abby can't get the <laughs> DNA in real life as fast as she does on television. Mm -hmm. Or David certainly couldn't do an autopsy as quickly as he does it on TV. Yes, he can. Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have so, seen you guys address like so, I, I think I think Abby's called out to one point. I'm not I'm not the CSI people. I don't work that fast, so I know it's been touched on. But I'm wondering like behind the scenes. But I, I think for the folks that work, I mean, I I worked it in the real world beforehand, and when CSI first came out, I'm sure it did have an impact to the point that when you go to a courtroom, and these folks can attest to that, that they're instructed that. What you see in real life or the DNA effect going back to the OJ trial, actually, uh, is not how it really happens in the real world. So I'll pass that to somebody that does You know, does the biggest that. problem we faced is the show 24. <laughs> and, and how, how can Jack go 24 hours with no recharge on his cell phone? <laughs> <laughs> Magic? <laughs> Well, I'll say that, that it, it's definitely an issue, but it probably in a little bit different way than you'd think. Um, it's particularly an issue with executives and up the chain and getting approval. And a lot of that comes from the difficulty in educating up uh, and for technical people to be able to talk in the language 
that executives can understand and hear and embrace. Um, and uh, we also have issues with our user community, uh, not understanding that uh, every cute device they find uh, isn't going to be attached to the network. Um, but I would, I would definitely say that we have a bit of a PR problem. Uh, part of what we should learn along with uh, the great technical things we can do is how to talk up. So, just real quick to, to add to that, you know, I think, you know, obviously media plays a role in expectations of, of you know, leadership or management. You know, they, you know, just to, to Mark's example about 24, you know, there's an unrealistic expectation that you can contain a particular incident. You can do the forensics in, you know, a matter of hours when realistically a lot of cases or things that you work on take, sometimes can take months. Uh, if you've got to look at, you know, a terabyte, a terabyte of log data, I mean, it's a very meticulous process that you got to go through. So th there is an effect to those that are not practitioners, but more to the management side. Thank you. Unfortunately, that, that's going to, the goons have uh, said we're out of time. So, 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 uh, so what, we're, what, the, what the panelists are going to do is go uh, across the hall for additional questions and answers. And Priest has a men and, men and women in black panel following this immediately, so at uh, 2 o'clock. So thanks for coming. Thanks for the panel. Yeah. Terrific job.